or we will not have a seminar next Friday. But uh, after that, there will be two more seminars, so I encourage you, you know, to attend. And one of them will be given by me. So. <laughs> okay, I agree with that. So anyway, uh, today we are very, very glad to have uh, Mike Mandel here uh, to talk about their latest uh, GPU product, so this uh, Radeon 5870 series uh, GPUs. And uh, Mike uh, is a AMD senior fellow, and uh, he has been working on uh, software and hardware development for computer graphics processing, you know, for a really long time. And uh, he has contributed uh, to many uh, GPU series, including Intel 740 and uh, AMD Radeon series, and also uh, play not PlayStations, the game console like uh, the Xbox 360. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, by the way, uh, my group has been uh, very fortunate that we have the privilege to work with Mike on developing high-performance GPGPU programs to leverage uh, their uh, you know, wonderful GPU products. Okay, so now it's all yours, Mike. Okay. Computers, they never work as fast as you want them to. That's not good. Okay, maybe we're back now. How many people are using XP still? Are you ready to switch? No, I'm still on XP. Let's see what happens here. So, um, Dr. Zhu asked me to come talk, and uh, I was going to share with you some today about our newest series that released last uh, month in September, the, the 5800 series. Most of them I'm just going to talk about the high-end part and give you a little bit of details about uh, some of the architecture and some of the changes that are in there, um, some of the in, in, interesting performance nuggets, and then uh, some of the new things that you can do with it. Um, I'm going to kind of focus... Uh, a little bit more on the compute side than the graphics side. Even though as a company, the graphics side is is our bread and butter, the important part of what we do that sells the large volume of, of chips. Um, but we're we're kind of entering a new era uh, where compute's becoming very interesting to be doing. So we're going to talk some about how we're, we've really entered this new world of teraflops for everybody. So students and researchers and stuff are going to have ability to do calculations like like uh, never before on their even on their laptop or desktop at home, let alone uh, farms of systems as they come up. And as a, as a company for, for AMD, where we really have a lot of CPU expertise and GPU expertise, in the, in the coming years you're going to see more and more fusion of the two and the benefits of, of some of the CPU computing features move into the GPU space um, as well. And then there'll be, be uh, plenty of competition there too. Um, we'll, we'll do a real brief product highlight. And then talk a little bit about the architecture of the of the 5870 chip, mostly a little bit why standards matter and how they they benefit all of us, the end users, the most. And um, very very brief on DirectX and OpenCL side. In in 50 minutes, it's pretty hard to cover a whole lot. Uh, Dr. Zhu is going to have a class in the spring. 
Um, and if you sign up, we plan to come back and participate in some of the um, programming practices and, and, and whatnot on the GPU to help out. And then we'll just have some uh, question and answers. There is still stuff showing up on my computer. Okay, back in 1976, the first Cray computer that was delivered, um, Cray 1 system in Los Alamos was uh, 160 megaflops of processing capability for $8.8 .8 million and 115 kilowatts of power. And that's been a little while now, but not, not all that terribly long, really. Um, and this year, we introduced a part last month there that's got 2.72 teraflops of processing capability on one chip that's a a little bit smaller than a nickel. In that last product I did this comparison, it was a dime. So we moved from a nickel to a dime in, in, in a millimeter area. So that's a 99.8% a reduction in power at, a, at 188 watts versus 115 kilowatts. It's a 99.9% .9 reduction in price so that the masses can afford it. And um, it's 17,000 times the number of float and point operations that you can you can exercise. Um, and it was a multi-refrigerator sized device then, and now it's the, the size of a nickel. So I would uh, suggest that our world has changed and it's going to continue to change in, in the, the, the things that students can do in universities all around the world now can be paralleled to what only a few scientists did in, in a in a very uh, sheltered set of uh, engineers and scientists that, that worked with the Craig first computer systems. Um, so this card is, is a little bit, of, it's not the very high end, because the high end will have two of these parts that we're going to talk about on it, um, or multiple of them. But so for the this, this single card, it's, it's currently retailing for right at $400, give or take $10. Um, and there's some variations in the parts, so you can actually get a little bit different uh, uh, capabilities depending on which one you buy. But the, the standard one that's going for around 400 bucks can drive three displays that are high-def high displays. The part itself can drive six displays, as we'll see when we get into some of the architecture. But the, uh, there's some external components, and so the, the primary is three. And three is pretty nice if you're working. You can have a three set up, and you can either make it one big screen or you can make it three small screens. The six is pretty nice if you really want immense of gaming, and, and then if you're really into it, you can have 24. I'll, I'll try to show you a little video clip where you can really create this. And, and uh, one of these cards can drive six of those monitors at real time if you're playing games. So the compute power is really getting quite, a, quite amazing. It was done in 40 nanometer, um, and uh, we'll do some of the difference numbers here. So this is kind of like all in a nice one place, but uh, it's a. a extreme amount of processing capability inside of one device. Um, here's, here's some of the deltas that you can see between the, the previous generation and the next generation, just in number of, and again, kind of from a, from a compute point of view, but um, 2.25 times as many transistors. Um, the memory bandwidth, uh, we use a, a, a memory called GDDR5, which is a high speed, uh, very high speed memory. And um, one of the guys that work at our company happens to be one of the pioneers in this area who really developed the spec and worked with the memory vendors to first do GDDR5. And our last generation of product was the first one to bring that. And, and what we've really done is increase the clock speeds um, further to raise that by, by, one point, by 33%. And uh, we, we find that this part is probably one of the best balanced parts that we've built yet with, with respect to to bandwidth versus compute. And that's kind of across the broad spectrum of applications that get run on our cards. I expect as the future comes that we'll see more and more intensive um, uh, bandwidth-based apps in the compute space, which may, as we find importance uh, of, of that, those kind of apps and the ability to sell parts because of those kind of apps, then that ratio may change. Um, 
Then uh, uh, some of the other internal things doubled by exactly two. There was, there was twice as many of things in this part as the previous generation. And in, in some areas where we have shared memories, they, they really 4 x in, in total capability on the device, along with our bandwidth capabilities. And the number of threads is, is 2x. The number of AOUs is 2x. And one big improvement where we've really spent a lot of engineering time over the last couple generations is to improve the power consumption. So some of that comes from the process, but a whole lot of it has come from paying attention to the detail of the design, making sure clocks aren't running when they don't need to be run, make sure that clock trees get gated off, not just, not just flops, um, making sure that data patterns that get locked in don't cause toggling, and then turning subsections off or even even individual arithmetic units and whatnot to actually really just drive down the, the power consumption. And we're really kind of entering into an age where a device like this, if you take all that stuff out, you can get three to 400 watts going in a, in a single part. And then, um, then, th th then it just costs a lot more to run. You have to have better voltage regulators, better cooling systems. And, and you know, the, everything's very price sensitive. Even, even at $400, you might say, well, that's a lot of money. But, but in actuality, it's very price sensitive for what you're getting. And uh, the, the, the boards can run faster and they can run, run, run uh, they can consume more power if you put better voltage regulators on it with, with some of the workstation products that we sell. That, that can be a primary difference is a much better voltage regulator. But one of the things that's happening is in, in the design is to deliver a total experience. So you can think if you, if you run a, a pure AOU job, um, where there's little bandwidth, then you can think that what kind of happens natively is the bandwidth turns off and the AOU gets on 100%. And vice versa, if you do the other kind of thing, you'll get more bandwidth power consumption. So what's really happened is when you, get, you can create jobs that have 100% bandwidth and 100% AOU. And, and, and sometimes you think that's good, that's what we really want. But then when you look at the power envelope for it, it's, it's not the average. So it doesn't mix across all the apps. So some of the engineering that's happening in, in, in the next, even in this generation and the next generation, is to really characterize what uses power and how much power it uses. And then have many controllers on the chip that actually limit what happens to stay within a power envelope. So that, so that if we advertise a 200 watt board, no matter what you do, it won't go over 200 watts. And automatically inside it will find the best load balancing of the different parts of the chip to run at one time. But, but in effect, if you try to write an application that's totally optimized, that makes everything click at once, these circuits are all designed so that everything can go at once at full rate. And, and uh, you'll find, in the, in, in, as we go in the future, you'll find that on a low-end part, you won't be able to get all of that, that ability because what you'll get is a balanced blend of it. So then um, um, I'm... Going to kind of go through this first part a little bit quicker, maybe than, than the last part, so that because it's uh, slightly, in my, from my opinion, kind of more of marketing stuff. But it's it's good to look at trends, and the, the trends of the performance per dollar that that the AMD GPU parts have been delivering is is on a slight upward linear type of trend, and uh, it. You know, there's a lot of effort and expertise to really analyze all the different circuits and how they apply to, to the different applications to get the right mix and balance of them so that you can actually build the smaller, lower cost part and still achieve the performance, right? And um, by paying attention to the right things, we've, we've even stepped off the linear curve a little bit and, and a little bit of exponential growth there. Um, but it still amazes me every time because every time we step into a new process too, uh, we, we find, you know, there's a lot of unknown things and unknown characteristics and a lot of scrambling at the last minute to deal with any and, any and all of them. So it's, 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 I find it rather amazing that these parts come to market many times. Um, and this is kind of another picture of a efficiency again um, where it's performance per millimeter and performance per watt. So not only do we, not only do we double the number of circuits that are on there, but, but in the same time, they're shrinking at a rate that we're actually creating the ratio, increasing the ratio of the performance per millimeter and performance per watt. So there's two sides of that, increasing, going to smaller geometries, and being more efficient in exactly how you, you control the power or the performance. How many more? 
buttons are there? No. Thought that was turned off. Um, so inside the GPU, there's there's kind of multiple subsystems, and so we're going to go in a little bit of detail inside the GPU processing engine. But but if we kind of separate it and look at what else is in in the device itself, is there's really a four memory controllers that drive eight D GDDR5 channels, or they can drive uh, DDDR3 channels. And the DDDR3 channels can be deeper, um, and they're, they're, a little bit, they're, they're slower than the G GDDR5 channels. Um, so the primary the way the board that we're talking about is shipped is with GDDR5. Some of the workstation boards can use the GDDR3. But the, the GPU has high bandwidth clients. That, that can mostly saturate all the bandwidth of the chip it, just on read data or just on write data or a mixture of the read and write data, the primary global read write paths that are in the chip. Um, and that's the big red bars you see that are directly connected to the memory channels. And then there's a, there's a hub design for all the low bandwidth clients or lower bandwidth clients. So he has a connection to all the memory controllers, kind of like the GPU, and he can actually sync most all the bandwidth himself into the hub and then divvy it up amongst all the lower bandwidth clients. In, inside the GPU, there's some lower bandwidth clients. Some of the um, instruction and constant caches are on a lower bandwidth path uh, in, in this device, and then some of the uh, command processing, uh, index fetching for, for graphics all comes through those lower, lower bandwidth channels. And then external to the graphics, there's a universal video decoder. Um, that does uh, all the video processing um, for the fixed function part of the pipeline. So this does the decompression of the MPEGs or the Blu-ray streams that are coming in. Then the post-processing or the, or the processing or encoding is done inside the GPU. And that little um, device there really handles the serial parts or the non-parallel parts um, in control to give you the, the high-quality video. Then you can see on the bottom right there that there's six Display engines, and effectively, those are um, those are DMA engines that fetch data, and and DDA converters that convert it uh, to to the different kind of display formats that can come out of the chip. There's PCI Express on the uh, bottom left there, and then there's a a Crossfire X compositor which works with in con conjunction with another uh, uh, GPU device, um, and. In this part, for the first time with the GDR5, there is error detection on the transfers from the GDR memory into the device. In, in, in this part, there is no error correction on the contents of the memory, just on the transmission, and it's automatic retransmitted. And then one of the other features, this link retraining, actually allows us to change the voltage um, and, the, and the speed of what's happening on the chip on the fly. It automatically retrains and keeps the links going. And so that's kind of from the outside. Now we'll go inside. Um, this is kind of a, a top-level block diagram that um, um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but this is kind of like the graph, one, one view of the graphics of, of the whole thing. And you can see that the yellow blocks across the top, kind of hard to read in here, but we'll get a, a set of slides so that you guys can, can, can look at them later. But the yellow blocks across there are really all graphics-centric blocks that are doing graphics kind of processing. So they're, they're processing vertices and primitives and doing tessellation, providing workloads um, for this, this um, compute device. You can kind of think that when you, I, I don't know how many of you have been involved deeply with graphics, but typically what happens is, is, is an application um, puts a bunch of geometry in, in, in the form of vertex buffers that describe points in space and the connectivity of how they're put together. And, uh, and, and when, when, presented data, when, when presented to the graphics chip, you get a command that says draw these, these primitives that are defined by the data that's in memory. And you can kind of think that what really happens in the graphics device is a task graph execution. So there's processing that processes the vertices, processes the data per vertex based on where it really is in the scene, where it really is in the environment that you're setting in. And then there's another process, and once the, once the vertices are done, it kicks off a primitive process. So in a very fine grain, you can think a certain number of vertices come out, and then you start processing primitives. And then from the primitives, you create pixels. And from the pixels, you blend them with the previous versions of the pixels, and you, and you create your color that's going out. So it's, 
if you if you did all of one of those kind of processes to memory, and then you picked up the results from it and pulled it back in and did the next step, the triangles, and then you wrote that to memory, and then you picked that back up, you'd have this bandwidth requirement to execute this task graph on the data set that you're doing that, that would, be, would be really tremendous. So these fixed function blocks really manage that task graph so that when you say draw, it does a little bit of the vertices, and before they have to leave, it does the triangle, and before the triangle has to leave, it does the pixels. And inside these blocks, it kind of controls the flow of data so that you can keep it on chip, but you can speed and feed each stage of the task graph in a way that you can utilize this immense amount of processing power very efficiently. So in graphics for the last 15 years, there's been the tremendous pull to go from, you know, um, integer, sub-integer processing, fixed function, fixed integer processing to create pictures to full float and point, single and double precision now in integer processing, very generic compute, and actually giving the, the, the game developer the ability to write programs to really control exactly how all these things happen so you get these much more realistic looking games. Well, the same infrastructure can actually be used for, for other things. So in the future, a lot of areas of, of research are gonna be how to find other things like graphics that have a task kind of relationship in the nested data parallelism that's available in there but hard to get to and be able to schedule it on, on these large parallel multiprocessor cores in a way that you can get the efficiency in a similar way that we do with the graphics. And as we, we search for the right applications that will really utilize this level of compute performance on that, I think that the same kind of things that we do for the graphics where you're going to find that, that actually work. So this, this new device again has a uh, some of the performance we talked about. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go past this. It kind of gives you uh, just a high level view, and uh, we're going to kind of go inside and work our way back up. So so you can have a little bit of a view of the different pieces that make it up, and then maybe as we put it together, you can kind of have an understanding of just generically how the whole the whole thing kind of works. So we're going to talk about stream cores, which is the the fundamental processing element. And then we'll talk about what we call local data share, which is a shared memory for a subset of stream cores or the processing that's going to be done on those stream cores. The SIMD engine is a collection. It, it is a data share in, in some subset of stream cores. And then we have multiple SIMD engines to create a compute um, uh, device. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about load store atomic data operations that can be done on this device. The atomic data operations are, are, are new and they're very powerful and they they will allow uh, people who have an interest with software to, to fundamentally do some things that haven't, haven't been done on scales or levels that they've been done before. So I'm very excited about some of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about dispatch and a function we, we, we call indirect dispatch and how you might would use those. Um, try to give you a little bit better feel for how compute workloads are launched. And then we'll talk about uh, what, we, what we have as a global data share, which is kind of like the local data share, but it's global to the vice. Now, unfortunately, if you download the whole uh, OpenCL API and buy one of our cards, you have to go to a really low level to be able to program to that. And it's, we're, we, we plan to expose it through an extension. Um, so inside the stream core, or, or really what what would be one processing element that, that receives a VLIW instruction is going to, going to issue five operations or potentially five operations within, within one VLIW. And we're kind of within one lane of a SIMD, so we're, we're looking at one, one small unit. So inside here, there's, there's general purpose registers. And on this device, there's just over five megabytes of general purpose registers on the chip. That's five megabytes. It's a, it's a lot of register space. And the reason we have so many registers is, is so that um, you're not plagued with spending all your time really doing context switching. If you go on a, on, a, on a CPU, a CPU has a very expensive register file that's multi-port, many-ported many times to actually provide all the, all the data that's necessary. But they're, they're, they're relatively small, and they work relatively right out of an L1 cache. And they, they can quickly dump their state to the L1 cache and pull in state for a different thread of execution. Well, on the GPU, with uh, 2,000 uh, of these little processing elements that are, that are inside of here on the device, if you spend 
much time doing that context switching just to get to the next thing, you're going to be burning your power and your time doing the context switching. And so what we actually do is we put multiple pieces of work in one of these machines at a time, and we actually cycle through which one's actually doing the work. So when one does a fetch through a long latency path, because it really has to cooperate with, with a whole bunch of other guys and go to memory many times to get his data, um, there's other pieces of work in there, to, other pieces of uh, work items in there to do work on the machine while those threads sleep. And those register files actually provide that. They also provide a very high bandwidth local to the processing elements. Since uh, you can kind of think of them as a mini L1 that's software controlled uh, for, for really tight reuse of, of data while you're doing the computations. But anyway, we get, we get instructions in that tell you how to read the register files. In, in, um, we we uh, really bring 16 operands from the register files into that oper operand prep block. And then we'll see as we go on here that we'll be able to get two 32-bit values on per instruction from LDS, uh, local data share. And you'll be able to get four D words from constants. And then there's a little path there that previous results come back around and get fed in as well. So there's roughly 17 arguments or operands that are available for the five um, operations that are going to happen. And, and there, you, can, you can think of it, there's, there's really a, a lot of flexible muxing going on in there to be able to steer that set of, of operands into those five, five operations that are going to happen. And the five operations can all be independent. They can be a multiply in one lane, an integer add in the next lane, and it can be a subtract in the third lane, and a, uh, a video op in the fourth lane, and a transcendental op in the fifth lane. Or they can all be doing the same thing. And as we'll see in the next page, some of the other times they can cooperate together to do more complex ops in one time to give you a, a higher IPC. And uh, in this device, um, there's certain kind of things that can be done in the four units and other kind of things that can be done in the fifth unit. Um, but uh, uh, transcendental in, is, is done in that fifth unit. The fifth unit can do most of the things that other four units can do too. But in one case, if you're doing uh, um, mole ads, for instance, it, it only has rounded nearest even where the other lanes have all the, all the rounding modes in, in D norm. So, um, We'll go on here a little bit. Uh, one of the big changes in this part, in my opinion, I think this is uh, very important. Um, those the the four processing elements inside there can all do FMA operations, and that means uh, if you're doing single precision, it takes the 23 bits in the pack format plus the mantissa, does a multiply, gets 48 bits out of the multiply. It takes the third term and it shifts it in place where it lines up and it keeps all the bits of precision, which means you have to have 24 bits below, 24 bits above, 48 bits a bit, 96 bit wide adder to basically get the result out of that. So all precision is maintained and that's when we, when we say um, uh, FMA, that, that, that imply or that, that tells you that the operation that you're doing does one round in a, in a multiply add before you go to the destination format. And what the FMA does, um, so, so in <clears throat> when you see mole add, that usually implies some kind of truncation somewhere and some kind of cheating in the middle in, in, in previous graphics part, which, which worked good for graphics. But uh, this FMA operation allows you to do um, really numerical things that you can't do without it. So you can you can really do a, a, a purely soft, an efficient software divider, an efficient software square root all the way to full IEEE precision. Um, other numerical approximations or iterative solvers can work with FMA that don't without it. Now in this part, we, we, we also, um, kind of with the unique multi-precision architecture that's done, we, we also enabled MOLAD and this is not a cheat MOLAD. This is a MOLAD that is a full IEEE multiply followed by a full IEEE add with rounding and normalization after both the multiplier and the add. So effectively in one instruction issue slot, you can issue two instructions. If the compiler finds a multiply and add that get, need to get done serially, um, this machine can couple them into one and do it, even if you have uh, all, all the 
the precision's turned on and everything, right? So a machine that truncates, when he goes to the, the mode that says I want to be scientific, he has to separate the moles and the adds and do a multiplier or an add. So this is a, a, a unique feature that this part has. Then we have the, the full I triple E rounding modes. Um, in this part, the, the next thing is we really have full denormalized numbers. Um, so whether you're doing single precision or double precision, whether you're doing the FMA or a mole add, the full uh, uh, denormalized numbers, which is when you get between you know, the very smallest number that you can have, you represent and, and you stay true to the math all the way through and, and precise. Um, the floating point convert between, six, between all the different floating point formats and the floating point and integer formats is all there. Um, this chip also added exception detection. So in all your math, the six different, different exceptions that can happen, um, we can detect those and track those and you can store them in a GPR. And, and, and when you get to the arithmetic unit, you can restore them from a GPR and accumulate into them. Um, and at the end, when you're, when you're done, you can actually store them out to memory, or you can check them and append, uh, do an atomic add to, the, to, to a memory location and say, hey, I had some exception, and, and therefore you want to go debug or investigate in, in production. Code, you want to have. Now, there is no exception processing. In other words, you can't unmask the exception so that it would trigger an automatic uh, interrupt back to the CPU. So it's, it's more of a, a debug feature to, to be able to, uh, when you're debugging or running a new data set, to see whether or not it's good. And that one, too, still has uh, work to do to get it exposed completely. But it's all in there, and it functions. Um, next one is we, we added 64-bit transcendental approximation. And to do that, really, in the, in the transcendental, like reciprocal square root, inverse square root, log, um, cosine and sine and exponential, um, we extended the ex exponent path so we could take a double precision number in and we could actually take the MSBs, which is what happens in all these anyway, the MSBs of the Mantissa, and go into the tables and actually get an accurate double precision. And, and for the double precision, what actually comes out is the, 30, the high 32 bits of the double precision. But with the FMA uh, uh, operator, it's the perfect seed to go off into an iterative solver for, for, for high per, precise double precision. Um, then in these units, these are some of the cooperative ops that I was talking about that actually increase your IPC. So you can do uh, a dot four across those four, the first four processing elements in one VLIW issue. You can do two independent dot twos. Um, you can do a dot three in a, in a single add in one slot, which is not up there, but you do dual dependent multipliers, so three-way multipliers, and that's chaining the, the multipliers in, in two of the slots relative to each other. Same thing with the adds, and the same thing with the mole adds. And so you can basically get a cross product, too. You can take uh, A times B minus D times E, because you have input modifiers, so you can invert the sign on one of the, the uh, float and point inputs. One of the other big things we added was the full 24-bit integer mass. So you have these float and point units that have, have the abilities to do the multipliers of the mole adds on the integer parts. And with, with uh, the advent of the local shared memory, there's address calculation that gets done in integer math that's all contained within certain limits. So this, this allows all that integer math to happen at full rate with no conversions. So the first four slots can do that. Um, a, a vast new set, the shader model 5.0 that's negotiated through Microsoft brought, brought a vast set of integer operations to the cores now. So um, you can see the, the count bit, or it's a population count, you can call it. Um, you can basically, with a single op, extract some bits, insert them in the, in, into another guy uh, in another integer, so you can um, do you can do things uh, pretty easy, like um, swizzle your memory by pulling out bits and reverse them and extract them back in um, so that you can get locality in your data sets, uh, for instance, the one thing you'd be doing. The find first bit actually allows you to do an integer library, a float and point math if you wanted to, or, or for, for other uh, types of things where you, you want to find uh, a higher low bit. I think um, I would find that quite, quite uh, helpful. Uh, reverse bits, again, is, is, is a cousin kind of to the insert and extract. And I think, you know, one of the largest uses for that is FFT kind of operations. Um, extended integer math, so there's, 
add with carry and subtract with borrow, which means you know you can do 32, 64, uh, 128, whatever size of integers you want to do, the machine's capable of doing that now. And then you have this, this interesting new op, which is a one bit prefix sum, and then the op's called the mass count bit. And, and what that really does is that when, when uh, you can do a test on an element where you can get a true or false answer, and our wave fronts are, are 64 of these uh, threads in one, one machine width. You can take that 64 lane and you can feed it back in, and you can do this mat, mass prefix, prefix sum kind of operation. And what, what the result will be is the first lane will get zero. The second lane will get zero or one, depending on whether or not the first lane passed his test. The, the, the next lane will get the sum of the first two, so forth, such that the answer you get is a, an increment and prefix sum. Now these can be used for compaction, so you can kind of think that if the first lane and the last lane said, I want to output something, and everybody in between said, I don't have anything to output, then the first guy would get a zero and the second guy would get a one. You'd add an offset to that and do an atomic add of two externally, and those two guys would know exactly where to put their data in a compact buffer on, on the output. So uh, a, a very powerful instruction. Um, uh, another one, we, we actually give the shader the ability to, to sample a 64-bit counter. So you can think no matter where you are in the whole arena in there, you can run an instruction that just says load a, a clock count. And so you can see the, the, this would really give um, people a lot of insight on potentially uh, how, what's going wrong in their program. Um, but at the same time, it might create lots of confusion because there's lots of parallel things getting scheduled in a way that just because it took this long to do an operation, it doesn't mean that your program is necessarily inefficient because there might be other threads doing operations in between when you did it. But if you write real simple programs, you can see certain relationships and measure certain times to get a feeling for, for what your program is doing. So it can be very good for a diagnostic uh, kind of tool. And then there's uniform indexing of all constants. So in the graphics world, you can you can you can have a whole wavefront index into a, a a set of resources or into samplers or or um, just into AOU constants as well. Um, the local data share is a shared memory, and in this design, it's a 32 bank memory. And um, the the idea is to really bring some local high bandwidth access. And, and be able to deal with conflicts in a different way that you can't actually do it in, in, in memory. So sometimes your algorithm is presented with data that wants to be stored in memory a certain way. And when you, when you load it in or when you write it out, there's transformations that happen that actually create conflicts in the memory subsystems. And you can use this local data share sometimes to transform the data so that you can, you can fetch it in natively the way the chip wants to and you can write it out the way it wants to and you've done a transformation internally. It's also a software managed cache, so you can bring data in one time, and then all the threads within a group can have access to that data. And one thing about our solution here is that, that the bandwidth that we have available from that shared memory is twice the bandwidth of what you can get from the L1 data storage that's locally. So when you start doing things like convolution or some other, uh, other algorithms where you have a high reuse of data, you can actually, I mean, you can, you can kind of think of it as that what you really are doing is cooperatively DMA in the data into the shared memory. Then you're doing your algorithm that has excessive re, reuse of data. Um, and, and you really kind of get, set up your memory view of how you're looking at your algorithm is going to run out of this shared memory. And then when you're done, you store it back out to memory in, in, a, in a way that's formatted, that's, that, that's uh, conducive to the export path. So you can kind of think of, instead of, this thread, getting this data from memory, operating on it, and writing it back out to memory in this place, what it is is these threads get this collaborative set of data in a cooperative way and bring it in. So I'm, one thread might not be bringing his data in or pushing his data out. It could be somebody else's, um, but it's done cooperative. Um, for us, the, 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 the second advantage is that uh, in the graphics pipe, the, the <coughs> main L1 caches are um, are ordered for graphics. And, and so you can kind of think that <clears throat> once you have a miss, all requests through those caches um, stay, stay behind those caches. And so the latency through the L1s, there's, there's a latency that's there once something misses. And when you use the local data shares, 
um, the latency is very short. It's zero latency when you're actually consuming data from the shared memory and when you, as we get in a little more detail, when you, when you actually order data, um, it, it has roughly a 20 clock latency versus the 250 to 300 clock kind of latency. Um, bank conflicts are all handled for you. It's something, uh, um, if you've been involved with much of this kind of program recently, that when you write your algorithms, you want to be aware of the bank conflicts. But the fact that the hardware just manages them for you, if you do write an algorithm that got conflicts, it's going to run correct first, and then you can work on optimizing it. Um, there's complete hardware allocation and deallocation in, in boundary clamping or conditioning, and sometimes you can use this boundary clamping to your advantage too. Um, we 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 recently increased the performance of a of a convolution by 60 gigaflops by taking advantage of one of those um, boundary conditions that are happening in the LDS. Um, and so the access is 32 D words per clock. We'll go on. Here's a here's a picture. So you can think of the the 16 stream cores that are sitting above this can all send data to this local data share in an indexed manner. And so you can see that there's uh, 16, and really the first stage of this thing is a, is a collector that can collect two, two sets of input and make it 32 wide. Now each one of those requests that you can do contains three operands. So you can do read two kind of requests. And what will happen is we'll, we'll collect that up, and then when we go to the shared memory, we'll do 32 of the first operand, or the first read, and then the 32 of the second read, so that you effectively can get the full bandwidth when you write coalesced kind of uh, accesses. But then, and again, this will be a little bit of an eye chart because it, it kind of put it all on there to try to be able to see. I guess maybe in the future we could take that one lane and blow it up so you can kind of see it. But, but what happens is that the address comes in and it goes to an input ad, address crossbar. So based on your address, a given lane is steered to the bank that it needs to go to. It does a lookup out of the memory. And then the second, the read crossbar actually pulls it back over to the unit where there's an integer atomic unit. So it takes the data from the input plus the looked up value, does the atomic operation. The result comes out and goes through another crossbar, and it's fed back into the bank that it came from. So now if the 32 guys are going to 32 different banks, and you're doing an atomic operation, everything works like clockwork. If they go to the same bank but a different address, you have, to, you have to make two passes. So whichever bank has the most hits on it is how many passes you have to make. There's, there's really no way to, to, to solve that. I mean, the only way to solve that is to understand that that's what you're doing and hash the address space so that, that uh, you, you create a variation that would be more prone to. And actually, the, uh, there's some research on that, too, that actually shows that can be good. But um, we're, we're still kind of the opinion right now that it's if, if you want to do that, you can do that in software, and it would be better to create um, something that you can actually comprehend, so when you try to tune for this, you can you can understand what's going wrong. And if it's hashed, it creates a kind of indirection that, that makes it pretty hard. Um, so then you can see off the read crossbar, the value that you actually read out of the shared memory actually gets sent back to the ALU units. Um, so if you're doing an atomic operation that, that wants the pre-op value before you get it back, then you can get it back. Um, and if you really want the post-op value, then back in your AOU, you can add your value that you added or subtract or whatever. You can get the, the pre- or post-op value. Um, many algorithms uh, use the, the pre-op value, um, and, and that's one that we favored to. Uh, you could do it either way. Um, so then the data gets staged and goes back if it's going back. If it's, if it's fire and forget, if you're doing an atomic add or an atomic write, you don't care what the value was, um, no data goes back. Um, there's, there's hardware control to make sure that you maintain consistency. In other words, if you do a write out there um, in, in a <coughs> different uh, part of your program, then it's going to read after that. It'll make sure that the write completed before you did the read uh, for the read after write hazards. But um, otherwise, there's no waiting. Um, so then if you take that shared memory along with the, the stream cores in a sequence controller and your your read cache and the texture address filter units, that's what we call a SIMD um, unit as a whole. So uh, instructions come in. This, the, the sequence on the side controls the execution of those instructions. It can be for any one of the data sets that are in there. So uh, we can have uh, a, a 
compute wavefront from one compute job or a compute group, thread group in there, and you can have a pixel wavefront and you can have a, a vertex wavefront and a primitive wavefront. So different programs can be in there at the same time. Doesn't really care. Um, obviously, if you fragment things too much, then you can have some instruction cache thrashing or constant cache thrashing. Um, so when you do compute, when you're doing compute, um, if you're running graphics at the same time, compute will come in and take a, a, a set of the resources, and pixel shaders or vertex shaders could come in and take another set. There's some hardware control that's trying to group things in somewhat so you get more locality, but the fact that it can be many different things. Um, what, what I call about thread divergence is that if you, whenever you group, so we take that one processing element and we take 16 of them, that's, that's the width of the machine, but the width of our wavefront is 64. So if you take 64 things and you put the first quarter on the first clock, then the second, and then the third, and the fourth, and you go back to the first set, um, when you, it's, it's one instruction for four clocks on there. And if the different elements want to do different things, then the way we handle that divergence in, in these wide vector machines, and, and everybody today still does this, they basically do masking. So when you go into an if, you basically do the if test, and each lane remembers who's, whether they're going to do the next set of instructions. It's called predication or masking. And the lanes that are doing the, 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 the top side of the if are going to do it. And then when you do the else, it fl flips the mask, and you do the bottom side. So you can think that when you're doing control flow, it can be inefficient. Um, use of the resources. Um, and, and with um, shared memories and stuff, there's this ability to regroup on the fly what you do so that you could reorder things in, in some way to actually try to increase that efficiency. So that's, that's one area of research. The other area, uh, the, the easy way is to go to smaller wavefronts. <coughs> but if you go to smaller wavefronts, <coughs> each multiple of two, you have to deliver twice as many instructions. And if you deliver twice as many instructions, you have twice as many instruction cache and constant caches. And if you have more caches, then you have less AOUs. And what we've found so far from our workloads, when we look over the thousands of them that happen, having the more AOUs is more important than having the, the, the finer grain control flow. New workloads are probably going to change that ratio, but um, right now we're better off to have the more AOUs that are being, when, when they're not when they're not being split doing the different things, then um, um, they're all working on the job at the same time. Um, inside these SIMDs, there's full hardware barrier support. So when every, when every thread in a wavefront and every thread in a thread group um, need to get to a point of synchronization <clears throat> to really maintain um, coherency in the local data share or in global memory, there's hardware mechanisms in there that allow all the threads to get to the same point, and then it releases them to go on. Um, so a point here that we have uh, private loads and reads from texture read-only paths. So that means that if you're if the threads or the thread groups are are, are reading non-shared space and memory with other compute groups that are on the device, then they can just read everything through this L1, which there's an L2 path behind it too, and we'll talk some more about that. Or you see I have a path that's going down that says export load store. And that path actually goes to a, 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 a read-write cache so that you can actually maintain with, with software control. You have a memory, a relaxed memory consistency policy on that path. And you can actually maintain coherency through software controls. I knew we'd run out of time. <laughs> um, so here's a picture with, with the graphics gone. It's the same thing. It basically removed didn't really remove, it just took out of the picture and, and gives you kind of a, a view of the compute device that graphics uses. And um, it, it starts out with a command processor that knows how to re read uh, stuff from memory and do synchronizations, total, total pipe level synchronizations across the device. Um, and, it, and it creates thread groups for the compute job. Now, thread groups can be one thread or it can be one wavefront worth of threads. Or it can be up to 1,024 threads per thread group. Um, <clears throat> so the, the APIs, the, the OpenCL and the direct compute, basically talk about thread groups or wave groups and work items or threads within the thread group. Um, and they're kind of like two names for the same thing, confusing. Um, but um, what we dispatch into one of these SIMD engines is, is a work group to go do some work. 
And uh, it, it on that SIMD engine, it has a resource of all those POSIT elements, the registers, and it can it can read data and it can do things in the thread group scope quite quite well and quite efficient. Now, if it wants to cooperate with other groups, this is kind of a new area. But if you really kind of study the languages, you can you can actually do it and you can actually control it. So you can you can um, because of the relaxed consistency, you can have a thread group put data in memory, and then then you can have it. Uh, Make sure all the data is in memory, and then you can write a different location in memory to say the data is in memory. Um, then a different thread group can wait on a location to contain that flag that all the data was out there, and then you can go read it with what would call a cacheless read. Now, cacheless read sounds kind of bad that you're going to go, you're going to go read everything without any cache. Well, in fact, you want to read the data that's in memory. You don't want to read the data that's in the cache because it's dirty. And if you have full hardware coherence, you wouldn't be able to read the data in the cache. But without full hardware coherence, you can. Um, but we have a feature called cacheless read. And what that actually allows you to do is to send a burst of request to bring data into your compute unit. And, and it, it, it's, it, it doesn't cache on anything that was in the cache before. It only caches in that set of requests. So if you do a burst and you, and you do the fetch and it's multiple instructions, and the first guy prefetches some lines, everybody behind him hits on those, but only in that set. The next set of instruction come along and does a cacheless read. All, all those previous sets of cacheless reads are invalidated, and, and he does his own set of cacheless reads. So there's this read-only path that comes um, well up from the center, from the memory controls up to the center, and a big, cross, uh, a big wide bus that delivers or distributes the read data across the compute units. And that, down the other path, there's write combining caches. And then there's, there's actually a read-write cache. Now, in the graphics, this is for color blend operations. But in this read-write cache, that's where the global atomic, so much like we saw in the, in the local data share, for each path to memory, there's an, there's an atomic unit there that can do integer atomics, the same set that we can do in the local data share. So uh, um, you, can, you can order. You can use certain instructions to go through the path on the, on the, uh, through the read-write caches. And when you do that, you, you can get a relaxed memory consistent view um, with, with atomic, unordered atomic access. Um, and this offers tremendous capabilities to, to, to do new things. Now, you can also bypass that, and you can go on a purely performant path. So um, we have... Uh, on, on the right path, you can actually send 32 addresses per clock. You can only do 32 pixels per clock. And each address can have a payload of 128 bits. And that, that payload in the path that bypasses just does right combining and then goes out nice to memory is all data. So you can have 32 times 128 bits of data going down that path. And the, there's, there's a limiter that cuts that in half once you leave there. Um, out the back. So the effective bandwidth is 32 times 64-bit values per clock. When you go through the read-write cache, you can actually send a packet of information. So it can be a, it can be a value, uh, an address, a compare value, and, and um, um, an actual value to use. So you can do compare and swap. The, the other piece of data that's in that packet is a return address. So the way that you can get the pre-op value in this case is that each thread that's running can own the location in memory. And when he does an atomic operation, he tells this last cache where to write the pre-op value. And then much in the, in, in the same way that uh, you saw the other thing, you can go out and reread your pre-op value back into memory, cacheless, I mean back into the processor. So this, this enables um, reductions in, in a, a kind of uh, allocation or that you can do, you can, um, do linkless manipulations, and really most all the things that you can do in, in uh, the, the big parallel computing systems that's made out of processors now. Um, so we've implemented an algorithm called OIT, which is a graphics guy. And what, what, what that really does is he renders all the opaque, image, all the opaque triangles in, into a back buffer. So once you're, you created this thing and then you start doing the translucent polygons, um, What's happened prior to is software's always sorted them before they actually send them to the renderer. And then when there's interpenetration, there's actually defects because whenever there's interpenetration, you don't do the, you, you actually blend things you shouldn't and you blend them in the wrong order and you, and you get some defects. 
So the, the algorithm that we implemented now with this new feature was that we start out with a, a, a head pointer buffer that's all got zeros in it. And when we get to the translucent triangles, for each xy, when we get to a pixel for a given xy, we actually allocate a memory location using our, our compact append buffers, and you put the data about the fragment in memory, and you insert a, a, a record on a linked list for that xy location. Um, and then you can think you can do all these translucent triangles, and what you end up when you get done is one buffer that has a link list with a terminating list of zero, which was the starting. Um, and so you can you can take a second pass in, and you can go in for each x y location. You can launch a thread, and you can sort the fragments there and blend them, and then blend it with the final destination. And and I'll show you a picture at the end here that that that. Uh, now what you can get is order independent translucency, which, which looks real nice and it's a, a problem that's been hard to solve. Um, let's see. So then, then I, I've been talking a little bit about append and consume. So in, in this device too, we actually have, if, you can kind of think that if, if you let everybody go out and append to a, to a given address, um, you can have a lot of contention on one address. So for the append operations that Microsoft's defined, you can, you can actually pin a record of a fixed size. And what we actually have is inside the hardware some hidden counts. And we use that count bit instruction to count how many are there. And we use that mass bit instruction so that many wave fronts in parallel in the system can be figuring out how they're going to pin. And then when you go do the append operation on the primary counter that's really going to compact stuff in memory, um, you've, you've already done partial sums. And when you go there, you actually get get uh, a whole bunch of threads accessing at one time and doing the atomic operation. So you've created a parallelization method. Now, if you want to do variable length uh, 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 pins, then you really have to do each add independently. And so the, then there's some ways to deal with that, like create multiple buffers that you can go into so that you don't have all the contention on one address. But the, but the fact is that the new capabilities here that, that was never here before. Um, one other feature that we have in hardware that, again, is not quite exposed, um, but if you guys, you know, get to the place that you want to use this and you can think, we have uh, a, global, a global set of semaphore synchronization mechanisms that would be faster uh, than doing atomics and memory to control any inner control. And, and there's really kind of two features to that. One's a barrier and one's count and semaphores. And so these are kind of... Um, powerful because things in different thread group can synchronize with each other. And um, you can use it to, to <clears throat> you can use it to synchronize big ranges of things. You can use it to protect data. And if you use peer atomics, you can if you think through some of the algorithms, you're gonna find that threads are polling. They're going to memory and they're reading and they're waiting for something to happen. Right? And when something happens well, now the problem is when they're polling, they're using bandwidth and they're using computation. And what, what these globe, global wave sync mechanisms do is allow threads to go to sleep and be woken up when something happens. So you can think that uh, um, if you do a, a, a semaphore in queue, so if you, set, if you set one of these things up to be a, a count in semaphore, then, and you launch some threads that are going to produce some data, and you launch some threads that are going to consume data, the consumers can go in, and they basically say if nothing's been produced, they in queue in a queue and they go to sleep. And when the producers actually produce something, he can go hit the same semaphore module and say, I've produced something which will release the consumer to go do work. If it's the other way around, the producer happens first and the consumer gets there, he picks up, decrements the count and goes out. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking to expose that through, through OpenCL as well and, and uh, have more detailed documentation on it. If you get to where you're really using it, or you really think you want to use it, I'd be willing to spend some time uh, talking with anybody to try to figure out exactly how to use it. Um, then we, we also have one other thing in there. Go back to that picture. Up in the top, there's a global shared memory. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's very much like the local shared memory, but all threads in the system can have access to this. And um, it's, it's a little bit less bandwidth that can get to or from it. But um, so there's uh, really eight 
different sets of address, each which could be a double address, so 16 addresses can get to it per clock. Um, so it can handle bank conflicts, one set of bank conflicts at rate, because it's, it's actually got the width for that. And in, in, in the future, we'll fully populate the bandwidth. Um, but what this really does is kind of like the local data share, this gives you a global low, low latency access to, to a shared memory where you can take some of those, if you're doing compare swaps to control synchronization between things, you can put them in this memory and not, not be exposed to latency to go and clear out to memory and back. Um, and there's a command stream way to preload this and to dump the results out after, after you're done, or you can use shaders to do that but it has the same kind of operation. What sort of latency are we talking about to get to that? That's um, probably about 40, 30, 35 to 40 clocks of latency. It, it's really going to be able to traverse the stack of the array from one element to, um, and, and get back. Um, so some of the differences uh, for thread group dispatch um, and group synchronization, the, the new shader models have that. And um, for those who haven't done it, uh, the, all these compute shaders is, is, is kind of a grid launch. It can be a one-dimensional, two- or three-dimensional. And um, I had another pitch I hadn't quite got ready for this, but you can kind of think if you're one-dimensional, you can take some number of threads and you can call it a compute work group. They're going to go on a machine, and then the next set are going on the machine. A two-dimensional is going to say walk so far in X and Y and create a rectangular region that goes, and then the next one, the next now, one thing about our, our, our thread group launcher is that it, it, it basically walks like a rasterizer right now. So it walks in the X dimension first, then the Y, and then the Z. So if you're doing a three-dimensional grid walk, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the first X, Y, Z thing for a thread group. It's going to go to the second one in X, all the way across to next, and then it's going to go down in Y and walk across. And when it's done, the first plane of thread groups will go to the second and third. Um, now, you can change all that by changing how you look at the addresses that come into the registers when you start, or how you m manipulate the, the addresses that are being created. But um, <clears throat> in, in, in some of our competitors don't really want you to know the thread group launch. In, in, uh, you know, if you want to create really robust uh, production applications that are going to work from generation to generation, you know, that, that may be good advice because if if somebody changes that walk order, it won't work the same way on the next generation. But for for university students and research professors and research people, um, there's things here that you can do. You know, you can you can actually uh, load a, a set of threads on this machine and actually operate it in a different way than graphics does. That you put a limited number of threads on and you have them do some work. So these synchronization primitives. And understanding how threads are actually launched into the system can be quite useful. Um, and, and, and so we, we really want to encourage, it's going to be hard to really figure out how to make pro, parallel programming mainstream and mainstream needs, right? And, and your guys' future and success, um, may, some of you may well be the people that figure out how to take it to a mainstream place where, where it, it uh, becomes a necessity or a daily part of our life, right? And, and since we've run into all these serial limitations of a, just a serial processor being able to do it, um, even though it's, the, the, it's hard, many inroads are being made. Um, and, and I think that in the next 10 years or 15 years, we're going to find many applications that really utilize the processing power. And it's not slowing down because uh, um, you, you saw the curves, and there's, there's really no slowing down. There's challenges to be, to be fought and battles to be won, right? But um, the, the, the technology is still coming, and it's still changing, and the way we use it is changing and becoming more efficient every day. And so it's not, we're going to be talking about petaflops on your computer in my lifetime, I believe, in your own personal computer. And then things like, you know, really research areas in different domains to, to a much lower level and simulating um, characteristics of things, even hum humanistic, you know, are going to become much more. I think we're going to see advances in sound and video and um, behavior analysis and behavior studying. And, and, and when you start predicting things, um, then I think in all the disciplines we'll see advancements because of the, the processing capabilities that are here. Um, 
I think we've really talked about everything else in here. Um, so I want to take, take a minute and talk about industry standards. So there's two industry standards today which, which are new and coming, which one is direct compute with Microsoft uh, DirectX, and the other is OpenCL. Um, and then we've had some proprietary languages, and NVIDIA's had some proprietary language, and, and one of those is, is quite dominant right now, which is CUDA. Um, we believe that in short order, OpenCL will become the, the prominent compute-only language. And for game developers, of which there's many, that target many, many um, people in the world, direct compute is a very nice and a very um, appropriate place to, to be using um, this compute as well. And so there's already major game titles that have um, invoked uh, compute shaders to do either pre-processing or post-processing. Uh, of data, and so that's just going to keep going on. So we think um, we've introduced products over the last three years that have dramatically decreased the cost of parallel computing. And, it, and if you don't have the competition, the prices are going to go up. You have the competition, the prices come down. And so by uh, um, deciding to program to direct compute or OpenCL, you're really going to be helping yourself in the long term because companies like our company are going to be here for the long long haul and, and we're going to be there to make it better and we're going to listen to your your inputs on how we make it better and uh, you're going to see that um, these mainstream open open source or open uh, environments that will give you consistency from product to product in in the release set of characteristics now, we, we may expose to you some features and, and we're going to tell you that if these features are exposed or they're through an extension they're going to have to earn their merit before they stick around long term. But, but we want uh, um, in a, in an extended workforce to figure out what things are good, you know, and, and we want to interest people in trying new things and give them an opportunity to either come work for us or start their own companies because of the knowledge that they have or the insight that they have. Um, so this is kind of our tool chain. I think we're quickly past our time here, but um, DirectX and, and OpenCL. So we do have Brook and uh, ACMLs, uh, uh, AMD's compute math libraries. So they heavily use Ready. So when, if, you get, if you buy an AMD CPU with a, a GPU on there, they will actually um, use the GPU um, quite extensively when, when the set of jobs that come to it uh, can be mapped. Um, and of course, the hardware underneath. Uh, in here, I've included some links to the OpenCL or AMD's version of OpenCL tutorial. Ben Gaster did one for us, and it's actually um, pretty good. So there's sometimes it's hard to find the stuff, and, and as a corporation, we're working on trying to make that more accessible. Um, there's also some sample tools and white papers, uh, and then the uh, Kronos um, website, which is where OpenCL has been developed. So we go to these really long, boring meetings where to get a good spec takes a lot of work. And, and people just kind of take it for granted when they read a textbook or they read a spec that, you know, this actually, you read through it and it makes sense. It really is a, a lot of work to write that. And an extensive amount of work has gone into OpenCL. So reading the first portion of the spec at least is really quite good for anybody that really wants to get involved in this kind of parallel compute because it it's uh, really a, a mixture of, of, of effort from several people in the industry um, that have tried to create a clear, consistent view of things. Um, and then direct compute, there, there's a set of introductory slides from Microsoft at that link. Um, so in kind of summary, teraflop processing is here, and it's just going to get better as we go and more capabilities. So I really want to kind of encourage you to, to go out and try it, no matter which domain of processing that you're involved. And if you guys are all uh, computer engineering or engineering scientists get to know some of your friends in the chemistry department or the biology department. They have things they want to simulate, and uh, th there's processing power here to do much of that simulation now. Um, open software strategy is going to bring you cheaper and better products in the long term. That's a, that's a place to make it work. Make sure you go to the the developer site and report things when you see them wrong, you know, or if you have ideas on how things should change. Um, and those two are DirectX and OpenCL. And our part is available in stores today. So 
I'm really excited to be able to say that today, that you know, we're there first. And, and by far, it's the, the uh, highest performing uh, GPU today. Um, so we have some time for questions. I think we already run out of time, so two questions maximum. Any questions? I'm going to be shy. Here's a picture, and there's a link up there. You'll be able to go, you can go click on the demo, and there's a video, or if you have the hardware, you can download it and run it. But um, this is a real body, kind of does a dance thing. If it had a little more time, would it run the demo? Here's uh, using a shader that's doing a um, um, field of view uh, defocus blur, um, or depth field of view. So you can see how it kind of like a, um, you know, I was kind of amazed I took this photography class with my wife because she's into the photography. And, and you go watch movies, you don't realize this, or, or a lot of people are not really aware of it. But you can see how the background blurs in the foreground, what they want you to look at is focused. And if you think about it, when you go watch movies, you'll see that where the director wants you to look at is crystal clear, and, and they'll focus, they'll defocus things out of there so it'll bring your human attention right to that. So. With post-processing filtering now, this is for the first time um, really, well, in both of our products you can do it with sharing, but it, it, it's really interesting. Um, and then there's a, a tool integrated already that does um, a hybrid ray tracer with, with render, um, which I had a video clip for that too. That's it. So great. Uh, let's send our speaker.